I can't help it, said Alice very meekly. I'm growing. You've no right to grow here, said the Dormouse. Don't talk nonsense, said Alice more boldly. You're, you know you're growing, too. Yes, but I grow at a reasonable pace, said the Dormouse, not in that ridiculous fashion, and he got up very sulkily and crossed over to the other side of the court. All this time the queen had never left off staring at the hatter, and just as the dormouse crossed the court, she said to one of the officers of the court, Bring me the list of the singers in that last concert, on which the wretched hatter trembled so that he shook both of his shoes off. Give your evidence, the king repeated angrily, or I'll have you executed whether you're nervous or not. I'm a poor man, your majesty, the hatter began in a trembling voice, and I hadn't begun my tea, not above a week or so, and what with the bread and butter getting so thin and the twinkling of the tea... "'The twinkling of the what?' said the king. "'It began with a T,' the hatter replied. "'Of course twinkling re begins with a T,' said the king sharply. "'Do you think me for a dunce?' "'Take me for a dunce.' "'Go on. I'm a poor man,' the hatter went on, "'and most things twinkled after that. "'Only the March Hare said, "'I didn't,' the March Hare interrupted in a great hurry. "'You did,' said the hatter. "'I deny it,' said the March Hare. "'He denies it,' said the king. "'Leave out that part.' "'Well, at any rate,' the Dormouse said, the hatter went on, looking anxiously round to see if he would deny it too, but the dormouse denied nothing, being fast asleep. After that, continued the hatter, I cut some more bread and butter. But what did the dormouse say? One of the jury asked. That I can't remember, said the hatter. You must remember, remarked the king, or I'll have you executed. The miserable hatter dropped his teacup and bread and butter, and went down on one knee. I'm a poor man, your majesty, he began. You're a very poor speaker, said the king. Here one of the guinea pigs cheered, and was immediately suppressed by the officers of the court. As this is rather a hard word, I will just explain to you how it was done. They had a large canvas bag, which was tied up at the mouth with strings. Into this they slipped the guinea pig head first, and then sat upon it. I'm glad I've seen that done, thought Alice. I've so often read in the newspapers at the end of trials. There were some attempts at applause, which was immediately suppressed by the officers of the court, and I never understood what it meant till now. "'If that's all you know about it, you may stand down,' continued the king. "'I can't go no lower,' said the hatter. "'I'm on the floor as it is.' "'Then you may sit down,' the king replied. "'Here the other guinea pig cheered and was suppressed. "'Come, that finished the guinea pig,' said Alice. "'Now we shall get on better.' "'I'd rather finish my tea,' said the hatter, "'with an anxious look at the queen, who was reading the list of singers. "'You may go,' said the king, and the hatter hurriedly left the court, "'without even waiting to put his shoes on. "'And just take his head off outside,' the queen queen added to one of the officers, but the hatter was out of sight before the officer could get to the door. "'Call the next witness,' said the king. The next witness was the duchess's cook. She carried the pepper box in her hand, and Alice guessed who it was even before she got into the court, by the way the people near the door began sneezing all at once. "'Give your evidence,' said the king. "'Shan't,' said the cook. The king looked anxiously at the white rabbit, who said in a low voice, "'Your majesty must cross-examine this witness.' "'Well, if I must, I must,' the king said with a melancholy air, and after folding his arms and frowning at the cook till his eyes were nearly out of sight, he said in a deep voice, "'What are tarts made of?' "'Pepper, mostly,' said the cook. "'Treacle,' said a sleepy voice behind him, behind her. "'Color that dormouse,' the queen shrieked out. "'Behead the dormouse. Turn that dormouse out of court. Suppress him. Pinch him. Off with his whiskers.' For some minutes, the whole court was in confusion, getting the dormouse turned out, and by the time they had settled down again, the cook had disappeared. "'Never mind,' said the king with a great air of relief. "'Call the next witness,' and he added in an undertone to the queen. "'Really, my dear, you must cross-examine the next witness. It quite makes my forehead ache.' Alice watched the white rabbit as he fumbled over the list, feeling very curious to see what the next witness would be like. "'for they haven't got much evidence yet,' she said to herself. "'Imagine her surprise when the white rabbit read out "'at the top of his shrill little voice the name Alice.'" Chapter 12, Alice's Evidence "'Here,' cried Alice, quite forgetting in the flurry of the moment "'how large she had grown in the last few minutes, "'and she jumped up in such a hurry "'that she tipped over the jury box with the edge of her skirt, "'upsetting all the jurymen on the, onto, their heads, uh, onto the heads of the crowd below.'" And there they lay, sprawling about, reminding her very much of a globe of goldfish she had accidentally upset the week before. "'Oh, I beg your pardon,' she exclaimed in a tone of great dismay, and began picking them up again as quickly as she could, for the accident of the goldfish kept running in her head, and she had a vague sort of idea that they must be collected at once and put back into the jury box, or they would die. "'The trial cannot proceed,' said the king in a very grave voice, "'until all the jurymen are back in their proper places. "'All,' he repeated with great emphasis, looking hard at Alice as, she, as he said so." 
Alice looked at the jury box and saw that, in her haste, she had put the lizard in head downwards, and the poor little thing was waving its tail about in a mel melancholy way, being quite unable to move. She soon got it out again and put it right. Not that it signifies much, she said to herself. I should think it would be quite as much use in the trial one way up as the other. As soon as the jury had a little recovered from the shock of being upset, and their slates and pencils had been found and handed back to them, they set to work very diligently to write out a history of the accident, all except the lizard, who seemed too much overcome to do anything but sit with its mouth open, gazing up into the roof of the court. "'What do you know about this business?' the king said to Alice. "'Nothing,' said Alice. "'Nothing whatever?' persisted the king. "'Nothing whatever,' said Alice. "'That's very important,' the king said, turning to the jury. "'They were just beginning to write this down on their slates.' when the right rabbit interrupted. Unimportant, your majesty means, of course, he said in a very respectful tone, but frowning and making faces at him as he spoke. Unimportant, of course I meant, the king hastily said, and went on to himself in an undertone. Important, unimportant, unimportant, important, as if he were trying to, trying which word sounded best. Some of the jury wrote it down, important, and some unimportant. Alice could see this, and she was near enough to look over their slates, but it doesn't matter a bit, she thought to herself. At this moment, the king, who had been for some time busily writing in his notebook, cackled out, Silence! and read out from his book, Rule 42, all persons more than a mile high to leave the court. Everybody looked at Alice. I'm not a mile high, she said. You are, said the king. Nearly two miles high, added the queen. Well, I shan't go at any rate, said Alice. Besides, that's not a regular rule. You invented it just now. It's the oldest rule in the book, said the king. Then it ought to be number one, said Alice. The king turned pale and shut his notebook hastily. "'Consider your verdict,' he said to the jury in a low, trembling voice. "'There's more evidence to come yet, please, your majesty,' said the white rabbit, jumping up in a great hurry. "'This paper has just been picked up.' "'What's in it?' said the queen. "'I haven't opened it yet,' said the queen. Uh, said the white rabbit. "'But it seems to be a letter written by the prisoner to, to somebody.' "'It must have been that,' said the king, "'unless it was written to nobody, which isn't usual, you know.' "'Who is it directed to?' said one of the jurymen. "'It isn't directed at all,' said the white rabbit. "'In fact, there's nothing written on the outside.' He unfolded the paper as he spoke, and added, It isn't a letter after all, it's a set of verses. Are they in the prisoner's handwriting? asked another of the jurymen. No, they're not, said the white rabbit. And that's the queerest thing about it. The jury all looked puzzled. He must have imitated somebody else's hand, said the king. The jury all brightened up again. Please, your majesty, said the knave, I didn't write it, and they can't prove I did. There's no name signed at the end. If you didn't sign it, said the king, that only makes the matter worse. You must have meant some mischief, or else you'd have signed your name like an honest man. There was a general clapping of hands at this. It was the first really clever thing the king had said all day. That proved his guilt, said the queen. It proves nothing of the sort, said Alice. Why, you don't even know what they're about. Read them, said the king. The white rabbit put on his spectacles. Where shall I begin, please, your majesty? He asked. Begin at the beginning, the king said gravely, and go on till you come till the end. Then stop. These were the verses the white rabbit read. They told me you had been to her, and mentioned me to him. She gave me a good character, but said I could not swim. He sent th them word I had not gone. We knew it to be true. If she should push the matter on, what would become of you? I gave her one, they gave him two, you gave us three or more. They all returned from him to you, though they were mine before. If I or she should chance to be involved in this affair, he trusts to you to set them free, exactly as we were. My notion was that you had been, before she had this fit, an obstacle that came between him and ourselves and it. Don't let him know she liked them best, for this must ever be a secret kept from all the rest between yourself and me. That's the most important piece of evidence we've heard yet, said the king, rubbing his hands. So now let the jury, if any one of them can explain it, said Alice. She had grown so large in the last few minutes that she wasn't a bit afraid of interrupting him. I'll give him sixpence. I don't believe there's an atom of meaning in it. The jury all wrote down on their slates. She doesn't believe there's an atom of meaning in it, but none of them attempted to explain the paper. If there's no meaning in it, said the king, that saves a world of trouble, you know, and we shouldn't try to find any. And yet, I don't know, he went on, spreading out the verses on his knee and looking at them with one eye. I seem to see some meaning in them, after all. Said I could not swim. You can't swim, can you? He added, turning to the knave. The knave shook his head sadly. Do I look like it? He said, which he certainly did not, being made entirely of cardboard. All right, so far, said the king. And he went on muttering over the verses to himself. We know it to be true. That's the jury, of course. I gave her one, they gave him two. Or that must be what he did with the tarts, you know. But it goes on, they all returned from him to you, said Alice. 
Why, there they are, said the king triumphantly, pointing to the tarts on the table. Nothing can be clearer than that. Then again, before she had this fit, you never had fits, my dear, I think, he said to the queen. Never, said the queen furiously, throwing an inkstand at the lizard as she spoke. The unfortunate little Bill had left off writing on his slate with one finger, as he found it made no mark, but he now hastily began again, using the ink that was trickling down his face as long as it lasted.